On this episode, we learn about a community action agency in Eureka, California. Then we talk with the bicycle coordinator for Caltrans District 1. We look at a well-trimmed hedge. We meet the sidewalk bushwhackers. Finally, we visit a rural road that is scary for pedestrians. Stay tuned. We're in Eureka, California, talking with Jennifer Rice with the Redwood Community Action Agency. What is that? Redwood Community Action Agency is one of, I think, about a thousand community action agencies across the country that Sergeant Shriver actually started back in the Kennedy administration to promote community self-sufficiency. And this community action agency here on the Redwood Coast of California has a half dozen divisions that promote um, family support and housing support and teen support. And the division that I uh, am co-director of is called the Natural Resources Services Division, and we focus on uh, uh, self-sufficiency of the entire community and the resources that we use, the transportation modes that we use. So we think about the big picture of land use, watersheds, transportation, and it's pretty fun work. We get to pull together lots of organizations who may not think that they should be working together and we do a lot of very creative, mostly grant-funded work here in the northwestern corner of California. What's the report you came out with recently mm. on uh, transportation and health? We got to do a really fun project funded by the Caltrans Environmental Justice Program with uh, a number of really incredible a, a team of consultants, and it's called the Planning for Active Transportation and Health, and we call it PATH for short. It's a series of five reports, and uh, Nelson Nygaard Consulting out of the Bay Area, Alta Planning and Design worked on it, um, Transportation and Land Use Coalition, and Todd Lippman up at the Victoria um, Transport Policy, Policy Institute, Institute. Yes. Uh, and Plan West Partners here. A bunch of great thinkers worked on it, and effectively our approach was to really analyze how well environmental justice, civil rights issues were being integrated into the transportation planning process. Because every dollar that gets spent at the federal level and at the state level needs to be spent equitably. It's, it's law. But the way that our planning processes are set up, it, um, no one's ever really trained to have that perspective. And we're so separated into our little cubicles of engineers over here, planners over there, social services over here, economic development over there, public health over there, they don't work together and so what we end up having is a system that doesn't serve all of those needs very well when all of those um, perspectives are so um, disjunct. And so uh, what we looked at was how do you integrate those disciplines better to have a more equitable outcome? How do you ensure that transportation investments are spent equitably? How do you make sure that people have the access they need to goods, to services, to education, employment, recreation, not just mobility, being able to move around from here to there and A to B, but how do you have access if you don't have a car, um, the roughly 30 percent of the population that doesn't drive, if, whether they're young, old, um, disabled, or otherwise, uh, need to have equitable consideration and equitable investment. So we came up with a series of five reports that provide tools for planners, for engineers, for public health folks, economic development folks, for them all to start thinking about this ramification from the economic development perspective. If the people who have the hardest time getting to work and getting to employment, employment and education, if that's made easier for them, it can only help economically. Um, for public health, if people have an easier time being physically active and accessing health care, it can only help. So uh, it was a really fun effort, I would say, to think out of the box and encourage um, you know, a lot of agencies and organizations that are really stuck in their corner to start working together and thinking about how to do their job a little more holistically. And what, what do you see happen when 
in, in, in places where these disparate groups have, have gotten out of their silos mm. and, and, and actually talk to each other and, and work together. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, what kind of experience is it for someone who might not be comfortable doing that for the first time? Yeah, it's a fascinating process, I would say. And, and another project that we um, facilitate from here at RCAA, we provide staff for an organization called the Humboldt Partnership for Active Living, HumPAL. And that's where we're doing that work. We bring, we, our steering committee is made up of all of those groups of planning, engineering, um, seniors, youth, public health. And our events and our workshops and our walkability audits all include those groups. And the cross-pollination is so thick, it's so rich, where our county public health officer here in Humboldt County now gives some of the most substantive input to the regional transportation plan update. I mean, her, uh, her evaluation of transportation and land use documents is on par with people at this point who have had all of that training. But she has this perspective. She's also an MD. And she got tired of writing prescriptions for people to go exercise more. And they kept saying, where? You know, or she'd see people over time, they moved to a neighborhood where they could walk less and she'd watch them deteriorate. And so she was very motivated to start making this change and has brought the entire um, Department of Health and Human Services at Humboldt County together to work on this. And they are now developing relationships with our Council of Governments, the Humboldt County Association of Governments, with planning and engineering staff. They just conducted a health impact assessment on our county general plan alternatives to where they pulled in data from so many different corners to say what would be the impact of a smart growth compact development type of land use planning scenario and transportation planning scenario what's the health impact of that versus a sprawl scenario and this is the first time this has ever been done to our knowledge and especially in a rural region like this but it had an incredibly powerful effect of, you know, bringing this whole new set of tools and awareness to the planners and the engineers making those decisions. And I, I just love seeing, getting those groups together and helping introduce them and helping them discover how fruitful it is to work together. So now we're having people who never before have thought about health impacts, who haven't thought about equity impacts. Mm -hmm. Um, does that change the way you do things when you actually sit down and, and, and take these into account? It does. It, it really does. Uh, for us here, we've been building uh, multi-use trails for a long time and, and um, planning uh, multimodal transportation. But when we really started putting this entirely different lens on it, it, ch it changed what we did here. I mean, sure, we can build the California Coastal Trail through Humboldt County. Beautiful. Oh, lovely. Everyone in Lycra will have so much fun. But can the neighborhoods access that trail? And can the lowest income neighborhoods access and have that same right and experience and quality of life that, you know, perhaps people who can afford to live next to the coast do? Those types of considerations, I think, are, it seems to me, fairly new even for the non-motorized transportation movement because my experience in the past has been that mostly it was, you know, pretty middle, upper-class folks wanting to have, you know, um, walking and bicycling facilities. But I think there's a growing awareness that the more we make this type of transportation available to everyone, the healthier the entire community will be. We're in Eureka, California, talking with Lindsay Walker, who's the bicycle coordinator for Caltrans District 1. What does a bike coordinator do? Uh, my job duties involve a whole bunch of things. Um, we organize uh, with a whole broad coalition of, of bike advocates and health advocates uh, the uh, Bike to Work Month um, and Bike to Work Day events locally. Um, also look at a lot of um, regional transportation plans, bicycle transportation plans, and see what, how they're doing on incorporating non-motorized um, transportation in that. Uh, also, participate in project development. So when we have construction planned on one of our state routes, we are looking at uh, how are uh, non-motorized users being accommodated. 
What, what, what are things like for bicyclists in, in District 1? <clears throat> well, District 1 is unique among the Caltrans districts because mm. um, through our entire district, bicyclists are allowed on all of our facilities. Um, it's a pretty rural district, so we have about a thousand, more than a thousand road miles, and oftentimes the highway is going to be the only way from point A to point B. Uh, so bicyclists for a long time have been allowed on all of our facilities, even if it's a section of freeway. Um, we also have a, a number of areas where the highway acts as Main Street, about 20 communities um, where the highway runs through it. And uh, both, having non, uh, both having bicyclists and pedestrians on state routes um, requires certain considerations. Uh, for bicyclists, uh, we try to get as much shoulder whenever feasible so they have space to uh, maneuver. A uh, long time ago we started installing uh, bicycle friendly drainage grates which you might not see in another district because they don't anticipate having uh, non-motorized traffic there. Uh, we also uh, accommodate them in our, uh, in our construction zones so as a standard package in District 1 you're going to see watch for bikes when you enter construction zone because they are going to be going through that area too. When, when the state highway becomes the main street going through uh, through a town, uh, does that create certain challenges for you that uh, you, you don't have elsewhere in the system? Certainly. Um, in, in a community, we're, we're still focused on getting the interregional traffic through. We're state highway, we're serving a very large region. Um, but in a community, we recognize that this is where people live and we have a much larger number of pedestrians and cyclists. Um, and some of the things we try to do to make the community more livable are incorporate elements like bike lanes, uh, traffic calming elements. Uh, the community of Willow Creek, uh, which is just on the edge of District 1, is, is a community where uh, a few years back we did a project to uh, increase the community livability. Uh, before we did the project, it was about four lanes with a two-way left turn lane through town. Uh, and it, it wasn't very pedestrian friendly, traffic just zoomed through, uh, and we came through with a, a safety improvement also to, to rehabilitate the roadway. And the community asked for, let's make this place more walkable, more bikeable. Uh, so what you'll see there now is uh, we've, we've done the restriping, uh, we've reduced the lanes, so it's now two in each direction with a two-way left turn lane, incorporated some uh, bike lanes, class two, so there's a stripe through there, as well as um, some community beautification and traffic calming elements like uh, landscape bulb outs. Uh, there's uh, street trees that act as a buffer between the state highway and the sidewalk. And, and when you go through there, um, it's, it's a striking difference. It's really beautiful now and it's a place that you'd even want to stop if you were heading through and, and maybe take a walk around. And you have a couple of major non-motorized facilities going through the district. What would those be? Uh, we have the Pacific Coast bike route, which uh, really runs the entire West Coast, but in California it's from the Oregon border all the way down to Mexico. Um, in District 1, it goes through uh, three coastal counties, Del Norte, Humboldt, Mendocino, and covers about 300 miles. Um, we also have the California Coastal Trail, which shares pretty much a similar alignment um, all the way through Mendocino County and again onto, the co um, onto Mexico. And what would the role of the Caltrans be on that trail versus the localities that, that it passes through? Who, who, who has what role in, in seeing it built and maintained? Well, the Pacific Coast bike route is, um, was, was originally called the uh, California Bicentennial bike route, and it was legislatively designated. Um, and Caltrans was put in charge of uh, not only deciding where the route would go, but also putting up the signs and maintaining that. Uh, in our district, we recently completed a, a, a realignment uh, where we went back and, and looked at where the Pacific Coast Bike Route was and, and how could we improve that route. Uh, not only are we trying to uh, add shoulder in certain areas, and we, we did a whole new sign packages, uh, but we also uh, looked at areas where we could take it off the state highway where it, we really had a better alternative. Um, so in the communities, sometimes they'll take um, the coastal the waterfront route uh, for in Eureka, for example, um, the highway is not particularly conducive to, to bicycle tourists, um, and so it, it takes them along the waterfront, which is much quieter, um, provides them access to, to services, and it's just much more pleasant all around. 
Uh, we actually um, also recently received a Excellence in Transportation Award for a pilot project we completed uh, along the Mendocino portion of the Pacific Coast bike route. And uh, in this project, what we did was uh, we took a standard application, which are these modif are these delineator paddles uh, that are usually used to d to mark the edge of roadway. And what we did was we took standard uh, universal symbols for camping, food, and our Pacific Coast bike route uh, sign, and we shrunk those down to uh, a cyclist scale. And we installed those at 19 locations um, in Mendocino County, and not only does this help, you know, prevent some uh, aesthetic impacts of some of the larger signs, but it's also something that's specifically for cyclists and, and, and hikers using the California Coastal Trail. It lets them know how long it's going to be before they can get to food or camping and that they're still on the right path. So uh, that's relatively new and uh, the feedback that I've got so far has been really positive. So bicyclists and, and, and hikers have the same sort of information needs uh, that, that motorists have. Then. Precisely, and especially in these in these coastal areas, uh, you can't, you know, proliferate too many signs because you have beautiful scenery, oh, yes. and, and and no one wants to see that. Uh, but it's a way to provide that service um, and and avoid those impacts. And how have things changed over the decades, and and how Caltrans? Uh, accommodates bikes on, on things like new bridges and so on? Uh, well, you're seeing a lot more incorporation of, of non-motorized elements into our into our regular projects. Uh, one project that's occurring locally is the Mad River Bridges Replacement Project. And uh, the current bridge is uh, two lanes in both directions of high-speed traffic uh, across the Mad River, and there's pretty much no shoulder. Uh, we knew that this is an area that we, we had bicyclists going through, um, it's between two communities, and currently what we have in place is a, a bicycle, uh, bicycle and bridge warning sign. It's loop detector activated, and when a bicyclist goes, goes over it, lights start flashing and motorists know up ahead, uh, you're, you, may, you may see a bicyclist, so, so be aware. And that was only seen as an interim improvement. Um, the bridge is going to be replaced next summer, we're going to begin construction on it. And not only are we going to widen the shoulders on that bridge so bicyclists can still stay on the highway if they choose, but we're also incorporating a multi-purpose pathway on uh, the east side so bicyclists can use that and pedestrians can also use it as well because it connects two local roads. So it provides another option for uh, both bicyclists and pedestrians to get between those communities. And you may not have seen something like that 40 years ago. It may not have been a thought. We're in Eureka, California, talking with Tyler Smith. Good morning. Good morning, Jeff. What, uh, what do you think of this hedge next to us here? This hedge is something that I'm, I'm glad we, I'm glad you asked. This is, uh, I think this is neighbors being friendly and, and looking out for, for uh, pedestrians in particular. Um, just the way that they've landscaped this makes, uh, allows for room for people to come and go shoulder to shoulder and, and not have to uh, compete for space here on the sidewalk. And I ride by it every day on my way to work, so I thought we could draw attention to it and say, uh, job well done. Again, it's even high enough for, for, us. for us tall folks that's to get right. underneath. And again, yeah, that's really, now you're really thinking outside the box here, because we're definitely in the minority of being over six feet tall, and, and there's plenty of headroom here, so I can easily go by here with a a bucket of something on my head. Yeah, and, and or an, an umbrella if it's raining or some other reason. You got that, that little extra space. Yes, exactly. Yes, a little extra headroom. Now, when you head down the street every day, not everything is perfect for pedestrians. What are some of the problems you see? Uh, certainly not. Um, well, the, uh, there's a section of the sidewalk up north here where the sidewalk ends abruptly and it's um, landscaped loosely with wild grass and some wood chips and clutter and it, uh, it's definitely a potential hazard and is a hazard um, to, to folks, so uh, you'll see something like that. You'll see uh, also curbs where there is no graduated, there's been nothing graduated down to the street for wheelchairs to access or anyone to access a, a gentle incline. And it's, it's just an abrupt drop, sometimes more than a foot. So you'll see these things too. So, so something like this really shines and, and those things are, are a blemish. 
Now, when you have you know, a gap in the sidewalk like that, are we just mm -hmm. talking about a theoretical problem or are real people having real problems getting by there? We're talking very real here. This is very real citizens. Uh, you, and, you and I probably wouldn't have much of a problem because we are, we're healthy, uh, you know, younger, middle-aged men, but people that are disadvantaged and uh, handicapped, elderly, you know, being that it might be raining or their, their sight might not be that good, they're definitely going to have a problem with that. They might not be able to get up it, they might get stuck in it, they might fall down in it, and those are very real problems. And, and then, you know, if, uh, if that happens to an elderly person, they could next stop is the hospital. Um, it could really, uh, you know, affect their life. And, and so uh, it's, yeah, I would say that's very real. We're in Eureka, California, talking with Chris Rawl with Green Wheels. What is Green Wheels? Green Wheels is an advocacy organization that promotes balanced and sustainable transportation on the north coast of California. What sort of things do you work on? We um, try to encourage the local governments to promote policies that make it easier for people to walk and bike and ride transit. And uh, we try to educate people on how easy it can be to, to do those things and, and you know, create a better place for people to live. And what are you doing today? We are doing what we call sidewalk bushwhackers, which is um, part public education and part community service where we go to homeowners who we've seen have kind of forgotten to clear the brush off of their sidewalks, you know, as this homeowner has forgotten. And we remind them that it's important to do that, that it's the homeowner's responsibility in most places. And, and then we offer to do it for them right then and there. What sort of reaction do you typically get? There's a wide variety of reactions. Some people are, are very appreciative and, and we go ahead and clear their brush. Some people say, oh, well, we'll take care of it later. And hopefully they do. And um, some people say, get the heck off my property. <laughs> so yeah, those are kind of the range of reactions. Why is it important that you don't have you know, shrubbery growing across the sidewalk and blocking a sidewalk? Well, one thing is you don't want people to feel like they have to go walk in the street um, because that's, that's hazardous for people. And if people are on wheelchairs or pushing a stroller, you know, they need to be able to use the sidewalk to stay safe. So that's one issue. Um, the, the brush itself can sometimes be kind of hazardous if there's thorns on it like this has. Um, when it's kind of wet out, which it is quite a bit here up in Northern California, um, the, the wet brush can get you all wet if you brush into it, so that's kind of unpleasant. And it just creates a civic environment when the sidewalks are nice and clear. It just creates a nice pleasant place to walk where you can walk side by side and talk with the person you're walking with and just enjoy a nice comfortable place to walk. We're talking with Carol Monet. Where are we? Trinidad, California on Scenic Drive, going south. And what's it like to be a pedestrian along Scenic Drive? It's scary. It's really scary. Sometimes more so than others when the big trucks come to the casino or uh, when someone's going really fast because they're really happy because they won or really sad because they lost. Or as you mentioned, possibly intoxicated even. So why would uh, someone be walking along Scenic Drive? Well, it's one kilometer from my house to the store, and it seems really silly to jump in my car and drive one kilometer to go to the store when it's right there. And also, it's good exercise to walk. I walk for enjoyment. I walk, I walk recreationally as well as for transportation. So, uh, how many years have you been walking along uh, this particular stretch of road? Ooh, this road, probably about 25, 23 years. Have, have things changed much in that time? There used to not be a casino, and it was just traffic of people going to their homes and back. And when they put the casino in about ooh, 10, 12 years ago, we got a lot of traffic, Brinks trucks, big, giant uh, fish trucks bringing food to the restaurant, uh, lots of merchandise coming down in big commercial trucks. So it made it a little bit more exciting. <laughs> but not necessarily exciting in a good way. <laughs> exciting in a hard in your throat kind of way, yeah. Because there isn't really any place, as you can sort of see, to jump out of the way. 
I remember once throwing my young son off the road and, uh, you know, kind of jumping myself as we were walking to the store. And, uh... What... What could be done to improve a you know, narrow rural road like this, or, or, or what could be done to give pedestrians a, a way to, so you can get from your home to buy a loaf of bread without you know, taking your life in your hands? I think in rural areas that the idea of sidewalks is ridiculous because they don't fit in with the scenery, and often the roads are like this road. It's too narrow to even turn into a sidewalk. I think um, pedestrian trails separate from the roads. There is one set of trails that partially will take me to the store. I still have to walk on the road a little bit, but I think pedestrian trails are a really good idea in rural areas. And you mentioned you have a, a couple of trails that take you part way, so uh, you'd like to see a, a more complete network that would serve you know, more people and more destinations? I think if they made it easy to walk, more people would walk. I think because it's hard to walk, only a few people walk. Quite a few people do walk up and down this road. There's a lot of pedestrian traffic here, really, even though it can be real dangerous at times. Sometimes they're easier. In the middle of the day, it's not so bad. Please don't ring. Hi, how you doing today? Oh, good. So, um... My, my friends and I are out here today just kind of reminding people to, to keep sidewalks clear so that, you know, people have a nice, safe place to walk so everyone can use it. And, um, you know, so we're just kind of giving you a little reminder to, to make sure you do that. By the way, you know, we have our tools right there and we can actually clear it for you right now. Oh, that'd be great. Great. Thank okay. you. We'll get right on it. I'll help out. All right. Cool. Visit us on the internet at www.pedestrians.org.